still yeah. a little I'm still a little challenged as far as uh, the whole tenant thing goes. I, I I never remember is the tenant supposed to go on the lid or the box and um, probably doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. So I I got to practice that. Yeah. Well, I think the only matters. tip I could give you, Shelley, is to make your lid first. Okay. Because if I make the lid for the female. Okay. And then when you make the male part, you've got more um, control of making it a lovely fit. If you try it the other way, you can end up making it, as I say, um, a French fit to loose. <laughs> well, also what happens if you do it the other way, then you have a ridge inside the box where stuff can gather. So if you're using the box for, say, saffron, it'll all collect in there. If you do it the way that Don says, it's the other way around. You don't have that recess down inside the box that yeah. can interfere with the lid closing. So it's like a very practical reason to make it the other to make it the way he says. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll uh, I'll take that good advice and give it a shot. Thank you. And also, Having done it making a both ways, lots of times. <laughs> But also, if you're making a box, when you take the lid off, you've got that little ridge that stops anything popping out rather than coming off with the lid. Yeah. Back on the hollow vessel, Sherry, when I make them, I make them like two bowls <laughs> with fairly broad brims. So I have lots and lots of gluing surface. And then uh, when I burn that line, uh, I don't worry about the heat melting the glue because heat will melt the glue if you have a thin joint there so that that's what works for me well that's a that's a good idea to try to and then what i always try and do is make the shape um or or the hole i guess in the very top i consider the overall diameter of the piece because you know people are going to stick their fingers in there and i don't want them to be able to stick them in so far that they can actually feel that joint right because sometimes <laughs> right. the joint in the inside is quite right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. i got a couple of those <laughs> with turning proctologists <laughs> <laughs> many years ago when i first started at the club here we um I was invited to take up judging on the competition pieces each week, month. And we had one guy, and he was a cabinet maker, and his work was beautiful. But every month he put a piece in. And when I judged it, my first thing, I always looked at the bottom. And he always lost marks. And he couldn't understand why. And I said, well, you know, you're a cabinet maker. What do you do? He said, well, I'll make a drawer and I'll just put it in. He said, and that's it. I said, well, when you look at something that you've turned, the back and the bottom needs to be as nice as the front. So he brought another piece in the next week and I rejected it again from the same point of view. Then he brought one in and said, there you fucker, he said, I've done it for you now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he would never finish the bottom of the bowl. Yeah, that's important. It's a it's a strange bit of human behavior, isn't it? Like pe people yeah. invariably, you have the beautiful workpiece, and they pick it up and look at the bottom, or stick their fingers in there, and you know, it's, <laughs> you know put some teeth in there for them to find. You know, that's I've seen that done too. You know, you stick your fingers in there, and there's a there's some plastic teeth. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a great idea. I think the worst <laughs> judge I ever saw on a hollow vessel. He picked it up and said, oh, it's quite light. But he got a dentist mirror and a little light. And he put the dentist mirror in the hole with the light and looked inside it. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> to see if it was finished inside or just ridged or whether it had been sanded. <laughs> I, 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 you know, uh, you've got some judges who'll go the extra mile to try and find some fault. <laughs> Oh dear, Sherry, you're talking about two-part hollow form that that Brian McAvoy was t showing you and how to do it. I took a, a one-day course with him, and I 
ended up with with this this one as a maple two part hollow form and that same method that that you were talking about. Nice work. No, oh, beautiful. This Put was your my first one. And check it. <laughs> yeah, you want to see the bottom. Oh, nicely done. And this was back in 2016 when I did this. Not, I wasn't too far into my wood turning mm. uh, when I did that. So okay. I actually take a little bit more care now in doing the bottoms to, to finish them up a little nicer. So. Yeah, How I'm did you fix it. the maple leaf, Stu? I'm sorry? The maple leaf. Yeah, I just burned that on with the with the wood burner freehand. Photography and colored and colored it with uh, yeah. I think it was leather dye that I used. Makes it very attractive. Makes yeah, it. Yeah, it was just a little touch, just a little piece on the side, just to. Yeah. Yeah. It takes yeah, the blindness of the bowl away, doesn't it? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Just puts a little piece on. Yeah. But my Lovely drawing piece. is right in this in the middle, and it 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 doesn't show really. It's a it, it's a it's a good blend. So, so what is the human nature that makes us stick fingers right inside a hollow form? Is it because I, I don't know what it is. Is it a curiosity or is it because they're trying to judge our standard? I don't yeah. think the general person is doing it to check whether we're a good wood turner or not. I think you're just right. curious. It's only a wood turner to a wood turner. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, Don, I made this yesterday. Eh? Uh, Oh, the salt shaker idea. Yep. I thought I better show you, and it works real good. That's just, the thing is, does it work? Yeah, it does. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> now you got to clean it up. That's right, yeah. I do. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, Stu, you should have had a couple little captive rings around there yet. Let's go the whole way, huh? Yeah, okay, well, I'll try that next time. <laughs> okay. You know, I kept thinking about you when I was when I was making this. That little piece in the middle there, that yeah. is a funnel. <laughs> <laughs> We're waiting for you to show us how to make a captive ring, Jim. Hey, I, I have the... In another week or two, I have uh, the blank, the blank glued together, end grain to end grain now, and I picked two strong woods, oak and uh, Osage orange. So we'll see. And I got in. I was so excited. I got in a set of chisels, small chisels, uh, carbide hook chisels from Penn State Industries. Well, that's new for them, and I said these are perfect. So. All my tool searching the other week will not be a problem, will not be a useful. I'll put it that way. So we'll see. I'm working on some bowls right now. Uh oh, Don's gone to his closet. We're about to see something. <laughs> well, I'm going for tea. Oh. By the way, what's behind me is, can you tell which rack, these are the same rack, which one has the tools on and which one doesn't? <laughs> I build myself, I finally get tired. Oh yes, Don. That's tiny. They're two inches long. And the rings are what? What? They're slightly smaller the than the cup. And you can see that the cup is very thin. You can almost see through it. Nice you job. Also, you're you're going to be uh, serving Scottish wine glasses now? You got a bunch of Scotsmen <laughs> coming? No, 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 no. Yorkshire, not Scottish. Your, your, Yorkshire, yeah. Yorkshire. <laughs> Yorkshire. <laughs> Back home. It was, uh, it was a competition piece. You had to make a goblet with a captive ring. 
Well, I think you may too. Would you, would you use a needle to cut them free? <laughs> I mean, they're so tiny. <laughs> no. A skew. Yeah, right. I made a gnome from a, skew. <laughs> from a very thin parting tool, I made it into a skew. So uh -huh. I could just go round. All right. Yeah. I've, I've, got a I've got a Robert Sorby quarter inch skew, the miniature skew, quarter inch by an eighth of an inch thick. I think it, that thing is amazing what you can do with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can send chips flying. You can take things out of the lathe that you'd never thought. They'll fly just this beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> and of course the thing with the skew is you'll know you're using it right if your shavings are coming off in lovely strands yes yes as long as they're not lumpy yeah <laughs> so we're gonna have a contest now bert that who's who sends a piece of feathers to the shop from the lake there that would be a good one i'll have to set my camera up and try that i was I wonder I mentioned if, is Doug on here. I think he's working this week at a factory at the one of the plants somewhere. He was demoing the other night how to make a finial using a skew. He's doing real good until the very end. <laughs> Had a catch and it splintered royally. So uh, been there, done that. Been there, done that. Oh man, yeah. 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 You don't need people watching you when it happens, though. <laughs> because if I'm videoing problem. it, I can decide to cut it out or not use it. Your worst cut Hello, is everybody. <laughs> There's another little goblet. <clears throat> and then there's a box. With a box. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> oh jeez! <sighs> and and I always say to whoever makes them, and you're using this monster lathe to turn the tiniest piece in the world. So, if Bert, I yeah. bet you he turned those <laughs> on a big lathe too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that was made on a twenty-six forty. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you see Alan Laser demo making a top that's about that high with his skew that's about that wide. You know, like, oh, jeez. <laughs> Hello, Mike. Yeah. Good morning, Doc. Challenge turns. <laughs> the best top demo is Mike Hustleck, where he makes a top and then yeah. spins it and he turns the top while the other one is spinning. Oh, yeah. that in my shop. Turned at the yeah. same time. Okay. Yeah. 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 Morning, John. Hey, I've got a quick question for y'all. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> morning. Hey, I've got a quick question. I got a couple of spindle masters. Yep. From the uh, from a. a online auction and they're really messed up on the edges now i was just wondering if anybody's had the opportunity to to clean any of these up what the best best way to do that would be right i i have one of those i bought it's you know with sorby was demoing it out of wood show here i think with a cbn wheel you could do it very nicely uh on a, on a regular silicon carbide wheel it's it's a little coarse but with CBN, I think you, I would just freehand. It's okay. not critical. It's, I it's, think it's uh, like a, you know, it's it's just a skew uh, with a rounded back. Uh, have you have you got a belt sander? Or a belt? Uh, yeah, sander? I do. Yeah. So yeah, if you can set do. up a set up a belt sander and make a jig to get the angle, then you end up with a flat bevel. Because I had a spindle master and I had a whole hell of a time trying to make it work, and I sharpened it on my uh, CBN, and I could not make it work at all. But now using the Pro Edge with a flat uh, bevel, now you can lay it on there, and it cuts like butter. So okay. I'm, I'm really, really sold on a linen okay. for those it kind is. of tools. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Bert, if you have so, a side uh, a side grind on your CBN, you can do the same thing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have a side grind on my CBN, but uh, but the, I noticed the difference once I switched and got some flat 
uh, flat bevels, I could not believe the difference in the tool control. It just, it just, there was a step change. It was, it was just great. I just love it. I still have I both, bought, but I bought mine over 20 it, years ago and I probably could count on one hand the number of times I've used it. Well, it's really? uh, 10 o'clock, so it's Lancaster Woodturner's yeah. uh, weekly coffee hour. Number 192 or three, I'm not quite sure, but I can, uh, my calendar would know if I had it with me. <clears throat> now, speaking of calendars, um, I'm going to, let's see, take a little spotlight here now. Yeah, speaking of calendars, uh, Lancaster Club's uh, open shop is this coming Saturday. Uh, I, I think Doug is going to be there uh, recreating the long thin spindle. Um, and we've done a lot of work toward uh, this Amtrak, Amtrak display that we're putting up. Uh, we selected the work that's going to go in the cases and we've devised a bunch of risers that are going to give it some vertical elevation that Barry is building even as we speak. Um, and I'm going to show you a world premiere slideshow of what we are going to have uh, uh, in the in the display cases. This is the first time anybody's seen this slideshow and uh, later today or tomorrow people who are participating in this and that's 30 club members that's a good turnout. Uh, I'll be sending you an email. Uh, with what, where to deliver your work and when to deliver your work and what information we need and, and what work we want. I'll be specifically sending it to you. So don't worry about having to capture the information off of this slideshow. Uh, before I show it, I, I want to say something else too about the, uh, uh, about these Zooms and about the Woodturners Coffee Hour. Uh, some of you have noticed, and certainly the, one, the f people who watch this offline uh, who can't who have to work for poor people who can't come here at 10 o'clock on Thursday morning. Uh, I have not been posting videos for about three months. I took a holiday in this, since December. Uh, it's, it's a bunch. And I figured out that what my resistance is not editing the videos. And there's a little bit of cleanup that just has to be done. My resistance is writing the blurbs. Um, and so this is a you know, production of Lancaster Woodturners uh, Club, and Bowman and I are the principal team. Bowman is the behind-the-scenes guy that keeps order among all you marching cats that, uh, with loud noises that come on and spotlights and everything else. Uh, so Bowman is always on here as a co-host, and I'm always on here as a host. Uh, we'd like someone else who's always on here to join our little team and write the blurbs. And that means just a one sentence about who who the person was and what they talked about or showed or whatever they did. And I used to do this every week. The thing is that once I've edited it, I've already seen it now two times. And I just don't have the heart to go back through and make that list. And it's stupid, but that's how it is. So don't all speak at once. But if anybody would like to take that on, get in touch with me after and let's talk about how to do it and, and what to do it. It's, it's not a big job. It's just a job that I find uh, has ground me down to a pulp after almost 200 of these things. So um, with having said all that, that's my complaint for the week. I'm going to show the slideshow that uh, nobody has seen before. And I'm going to do it by going to there and I have to turn my background off. Give me one second here. Okay. Oh, which camera is it? Why am I not seeing that? There it is. Okay, I'm going to start this slideshow. Uh, first of all, what you're seeing here is uh, we had a meeting online uh, uh, on the 27th, and anybody who attended, I think about 20 of you all attended, we went through the slides and just talked about them. The work that people offered up for this display. We've got two 10 foot long cases by two feet wide. And they're about eight feet tall and there's a plinth in them already. So these tables with tape on them represent the plinth spaces that we've got. And we boxed it out into 28 spaces and we worked with the photographs and we've, most of us have seen the work because most of this work has shown up at club show and tells over the last couple of months. And we're familiar with these guys and these turning. So we're pretty familiar with how big things are. Uh, and we're going to use risers to get ourselves some verticality as well as some vertical places to position things like platters up on edge. So this is the situation and this leads us to uh, this slideshow. There'll be four seconds for each piece if it'll start. Here it goes. Thank you. 
I should have put a music track down, but I just put this together this morning. And of course, the slideshow tells you nothing about scale, and I deliberately took all the writing off just to look at pictures. <clears throat> so I'm going to send this over to the Arts Commission to later uh, this week to let them know what we're up to. You guys got the world premiere here. Boy, that's some pretty impressive work. It's an amazing slideshow. It really blows me away. And it's a range of skills, and it's a range of uh, beginners to experts. Uh, and this is telling you nothing about the groupings. You know, we've put a lot of attention on what goes with what. And so some pieces will get a little pedestal all to themselves, and other pieces will be sharing it with other pieces of similar scale and or related technique. But you can, the range of work here is enormous. How many pieces is it, John, total? I think it's around, there's 63 slides here, but I think it's about 75, 72 pieces, I think. That's um, a lot. It's hard to tell because the trees are going to make a little forest and the snowmen, uh, you know, and like how many pieces is this little cups of dugs, you know? Um, so it's a little ambiguous. I'm blown away, really, by the range and the quality of the work. And it's, this is like a third of the club, 30% of the club. John, it's Ron Sheehan. Uh, yeah. This slideshow is pretty phenomenal. I mean, when you look at the range, like you say, the range of work and the talent that's involved here, this show deserved to be seen by a whole lot of other woodturners, in my opinion. I would just suggest we do that. Hang on a second, Ron. Let me get my camera back and uh, my background back. And uh, so we're back in business here. Give me one second here. Well, I don't know where we go with it, but somehow I think that that needs some wider distribution. That's a beautiful show. Well, I'm thinking that uh, once we get this thing up at the Amtrak station, we'll invite, uh, for example, library people from around the area to come and make sure they see it because they have exhibition space. And I'm pretty sure we'll try and get something in the local paper. Uh, and I I will be putting this slideshow up in some way or other. I don't know. You know, that's... Uh, yeah, that's about uh, that's we can, what we're going to do so far. If you've got other ideas, though, bring them aboard. I wonder if we can get WGAL involved. I'm pretty sure we could at some point. Sure. Do you know, have you done that sort of thing? Do you know how to do it? Uh, no, I have not personally. You want to learn? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to look club, into you it. Know, we don't have any paid staff. You want to do something? Yeah. We want something to happen. Let's, uh, it might be you and the one to have to figure it out. <laughs> I'd be willing to look into it. Okay. Um, I, we have not talked to the Arts Commission about whether we can have a, an opening of any kind at the Amtrak station. I, I've kind of been waiting until I had this slideshow together so I could report to them what we're doing and put a whole lot of questions to them in one meeting rather than a whole scattershot. So I got a running list of questions to ask them that includes 
if we have an event, then we'll publicize the event. And, you know, I've, I've worked for daily newspapers. They're dying for pictures of things they haven't seen quite before. You know, so if we have 30 people there drinking uh, soda pop and pretending it's a wine reception while the commuters stream through the station, we might get a little <laughs> pretty interesting photograph. <laughs> you, know, you know, John, you may, you may want to consider a, an article for the American Wood Turner and then a link to uh, to uh, the slideshow. Oh, I will certainly plant that. Yeah. Okay. Anybody who reads it closely, you'll you'll know that I plant stuff in there all the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, ju just a tip. I worked in television news for many decades. Do not tell them now. And expect them to show up when it's there. Wait till, wait till the time, because they only make decisions by the hour on the given day. Oh yeah, no, yeah, he's, just, absolutely, he's get, absolutely right. And then get it when there's somebody there that can be interviewed and talk about it. I think there's a good chance. I mean, don't pick a busy news day like election day or something. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not quite sure what day we actually have in there either. There's been some discussion and a little bit of shifting around on it. So I want, I'm, I'm going to get all of that sorted out. But I needed to have this slideshow to do that so that they could they could see, well, yeah, yeah, we're on this. Yeah. And the I, other I'm, thing I'm, I mentioned I'm so impressed you, with the work. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. John, you, you I, I chatted with you a little bit about this. There's a lot of good galleries downtown Lancaster. And, and if they get up there and see that this is art, rather than in their mind just wood turning why i think they will um, respond and want us downtown some of them are looking for people to show especially sure. first fridays there's an art museum downtown too you know and they are also also struggling for shows so we see our club has never done anything like this before so uh, this is a first venture and we figure you know, we're putting attention on the display and we're making display risers that are going to be very versatile um because uh, i think this is going to lead to more stuff there's you know we're, we're big enough now to sustain this kind of thing and there's interest in it and there's people who want to sell work as well as show it so you know it's just an expansion of uh as the club gets bigger the things we do get bigger too and John, while you have it all together, when you take it down before you distribute it out, if you have some place to take it, why, like Mulberry Street Gallery, they have big space. You could reset it right up. You don't have to worry about getting it all together again. Except for work that people might sell during. There are some people who want to sell work. They can't go out during the exhibition, but you know, if somebody wants a piece and they they and they've been told it comes down August tenth, well. They're going to want their piece August 10th. Uh, we can always negotiate around those two, and we don't have to move the whole exhibition if some pieces leave. So, you know, it won't make any difference at that scale. Um, so, anyway, on with that. Uh, enough of that, uh, I think. Thank you for uh, seeing the slideshow and uh, questions and comments. Any more? Did we get it all? All right. Um, Kai got in touch with me ahead of time, and he's also got a show. So I'm going to go to show your show now, Kai. Is that okay with you? Yeah, I'll try to share it. Okay. Um... Okay. Um, can you see the PowerPoint? Yeah, we got it. Yep. Yeah, great. Um, so I got some interesting wood lately. It's called Arrow Carrier. I hope that's pronounced the right way. Um, and also it's called Monkey Puzzle Tree. So that's easier for me. Um, and that's what the, the tree looks like. Um, on the right hand, the, the tree is growing in Ireland. And I took that um, during a holiday in Ireland two years ago. And it's got um, interesting kind of needles. Um, and what you see normally in Germany is more like this, um, not that um, big. Uh, but um, a friend of mine who's a, a tree surgeon gave me a piece of arrow carrier trunk that you can see here on the right hand side. Um, it had been down for some time and lying somewhere wet. So um, 
there is some discoloration in the wood already. So, um, and that's what I turned out of it. And um, it looks quite nice that it's not an even color, I think. So um, kind of the, the swirling around the, the branches is more interesting with um, the um, fungus that is in there. And this is one piece um, just photographed from different angles. It's about 50, 150 millimeters or 5.5 inches high and has a diameter of 140 millimeters or six inches. And approach um, came also um, from the, the same part of the, the tree. This is only 50 millimeters or two um, inches in diameter. And another work piece, 160 millimeters high and with a diameter of 170 millimeters or 6.3 inches high and 7 uh, 6.7 inches tall. No, sorry, in diameter. Um, um, what do you think makes the color? The, the, what, the, is it fungus or is it, what is it? Um, it's called, I think in German, it's called Plaufeule. So um, it's blue rot or something like this. Does that exist okay. in English? Yeah, blue, uh, blue. there is a thing called blue rot or blue fungus that shows up in pine and other softwoods. Yeah. Yeah, and that 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 is kind of um, pine, um, this, this yeah. wood, yeah. It's, it's definitely a, a soft wood, yeah. Very pretty. So, and I want to show you the bottom as well and or the foot and this is for a reason do you realize anything when you look at the the photo of the foot it's right in the middle yeah okay anything special yeah the center core is uh, spongy yeah yeah it is and you can lose that very easily mm -hmm. it's even more spongy than in the photo i'll show you that's what it was like. Um, <laughs> and I got that hole, which is not a funnel. It's really the center core coming out. Yes. Yeah, quite so I, I decided to repair that and um, placed um, a piece of wood on it with a hole in it just to get the center right for my Fosner bit. And then I drilled through here um, using the drill press and got a, a clean hole and then um, these branch bases um, that you saw on the photo in the beginning or down here they are at well as well um, that I cut off before turning um, I used to turn um, a dowel or a plug um, that I put into the the foot and that's how I got this <laughs> yeah so, so you you inlaid a knot. <laughs> yeah. So it's yeah. a bit cheating, but it looks better than, than before. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess this is due to the fact that this is already a bit soft anyway. And then with um, the rot that was in there, it um, deteriorated or deteriorated. And um, so I, it came out. Yeah. And that's a little bit about the, the hollowing. A friend of mine made a long tool rest for me that reaches deep into the, the vase or the hollow form, um, which is really handy if you want to clean up the inside using um, a scraper later on. And I did most of the hollowing with this. Uh, I drilled a hole first to the right depths with a big Forstner bit. And then I did most of the hollowing using this um, round cutter here with a, a long handle that I made for that purpose. It's about two feet long. Um, so it's balanced nicely. And then- Is that a drop point? Is that a drop point? Yeah, it, the, it, it, no, it, this is just a round cutter here, but it the cut is set at an angle into the, the, into the, the shank. So it's, it's kind of it's the bottom tool in this. It's, it's the bottom tool in this array. Is that right? 
yeah that's yeah. um that's the bottom two yeah so that's the one i used for most of the hollowing and that's the tip of this um bottom two yeah is it cut cutter yeah yeah um one of those that are used for cat cutting aluminum normally um and you can use them for cutting wood as well i think we discussed that um earlier on in during the morning coffee hour meeting yeah well, yeah we did a couple months ago yeah yeah you have, so, do you have it mounted at an angle kai sorry could you say that again do you have it mounted at an angle it looks yes, like it's yes. tipped forward yeah yeah it's My, sloping towards a little bit yeah that's right i i need to do that i had mine out yesterday that same cutter and i wasn't being very satisfied so i know the mate tool has a like a 22 degree angle and i think that's pretty cool so hmm. but i still find it difficult to get a nice smooth um surface with um a cutter that that's small so if you have the chance to get in with a scraper to clean it up later on um that improves the the surface quality a lot yeah so and um i bought this um scraper some time ago and had it lying around in the workshop and i thought for this purpose i would like to put a handle on it and i can show you quickly how i made the this long handle for the the cutter so this is the the shank of the um the scraper and it's rather short and wide. So I didn't dare hammering it into a round hole because I feared either it wouldn't go there in there well, or it might not be a good fit later on. So I decided to um, make kind of a, a sandwich handle using three layers of wood. Um, the middle layer I planed down to the same thickness as the um, the scraper, and then I that's this one, and then I positioned it kind of in the middle of my um, middle layer and draw a line drew a line around it, and after this oh, next one I cut out the the shape. And I cut it out a little bit deeper than than my actual line was. And after that, um, I sandwiched this middle layer between two other pieces, which used to be a table leg that I cut in half. Um, and um, yeah, and then for turning, I put a little um, wedge um, into this um, opening here. And um, used a ring center to um, um to turn the the handle between centers and then later on i put um a screw into the wedge to pull it out again um yeah and the the handle has a, a really nice fit or the the shank has a, a really nice fit inside the handle so that's a a nice tool to work it's a bit awkward to sharpen because the handle is rather long and I don't want to take it out, um, the, the tool out of the handle um, for sharpening. So I'll leave it in there and I need enough space behind me so I can use my grinder for sharpening or resharpening the tool. Okay. That's so it. you, Kai, you didn't embed that in any epoxy or anything? You just have a tight fit? Just a tight fit. I, I didn't use any clue for that. I just hammered it in. So it should come out again, but... Um, I won't try until it comes out by itself. Somebody's got to end the screen share over there. Um, yeah, I, I stopped that. Sorry. There you yeah. go. Good. Uh, Kai, I wonder how the, the uh, Ashley uh, Isles, I guess, how they originally mounted that because of the challenges that you discussed with the, such a sharp taper. Yeah. I actually can't remember when I bought the tool, I bought that at the wood turning symposium in, in Germany and the tool had a short handle. And as I wanted a tool for a, with a long handle anyway, I asked whether they sell um, the this scraper unhandled as well. And um, the um, vendor said, well, no problem and took off the handle, put it aside and sold the tool to me without the handle. 
I guess for the same price as with the handle. Um, <laughs> but um, I can't remember what the handle looked like. Um, in the photo, there was a, a shorter scraper by Henry Taylor, and they actually have a round hole or a drilled hole in there, and they put the um, the scraper into this round um, hole. Um, but um, maybe if you have a stepped drill or something like this, and you can drill um, a co conical hole or something like that, um, that might work. Or if you drill into the um, the handle with different diameters, starting with um, yeah. a small diameter deep hole yeah. and several other holes. So, yeah, that might work. But I like the the sandwiched version and that um is really really fine so yeah i make a lot of tools all the tools i make i make with the sandwich version handle it's it's very easy it's a really nice handle a uh, little epoxy in there it'll never come out or if you it's a reversible tool you can make them so they slide out and go back in so yeah. it's a very very easy way to manage anything with that's flat <laughs> Yeah, even round, but the flats, yeah, that really works. Mm -hmm. um, okay, anybody else on this? Interesting wood and uh, really good technique, I think. Thank you, Kai. Um, yeah, I'm thanks for listening. To... Yeah, Barry, Barry, uh, you there? Barry's got his hand up, but I think he made cameras off. Barry, if you can hear me, come on aboard. Barry's our club president. I want to get it. If he's got something he wants to say, I want to hear it. <laughs> okay, well, we'll get him when he comes back. Um, Jerry Snelson, you're up next. I'd like to share screen. Go for it. Hoping this comes up. Got it. <laughs> you can see here. Oh, okay, yeah. this is uh, the latest in my series of smokers uh, <laughs> or incense burners. And this is uh, Mrs. Goodness, or Oma Goodness, as in Oma Goodness. She's uh, <laughs> suggested by my daughter, who said, make a rocking chair with a knitter in it. And my wife specked it out with, uh, put a sheep in there and a dog. And uh, so uh, Jackie made the shawl and the, the, the knitting. And uh, I guess the caption for this should be, after I finish this row, which is the thing that my wife says more than anything else in this world, as soon as I finish this row, because she's the consummate knitter as well as a quilt maker. Um, that's this is uh, she's got her new trainers on and her uh, running suit. So as soon as she uh, finishes this uh, row and this uh, pipe full of, of tobacco, uh, then she's ready to go for her her run. I don't know if you can tell, but the, the yarn is coming directly off of Sean's back. So that's Sean the sheep there, and with a little Scotty dog at her feet. And the, the chair took me several days to make, uh, afternoons. And it's got uh, decals on the back. You can see a little bit of the one on the front, and there's a big butterfly on the back. It's, it's kind of pretty. And um, I, I guess that's all I know to, to say about it. She took me She's built on another cigar box, but I've forgotten the name of the cigars. Uh, <laughs> they make nice bases. Um, you know, I don't have to smoke the cigars. So, um, so how, how many pieces of wood are in that? How many turnings did you assemble to get to here? Looks like well, 30 the, maybe? Well, probably the, the, the body is hollowed out. So, and then there's the head. They're, they're separate. And the upper arms and the lower arms and the hands and then the 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 feet and the lower legs and the upper legs and um then then the, the lamp has one two three four turnings in it and sean the sheep has two three four five six uh turnings and the dog has one and, and so it, it i i do a couple of turnings a day in the afternoon and and call it uh call it a day it, it's, so where it's, do you start uh, though when you want to make one of these do you make the smoker part first the body yeah I, I i do that i make the body because the the chair had to fit the body and All so right, I, yeah. I just made made the body and hollowed it out 
and then made the chair and and then started and I made one day I made uh, feet and and lower legs and then uh, upper legs and, and and so on. Um, I just uh, you know it's a retirement project, so I don't you, go right straight through. And you paint the, them as paint, you go, don't you? I paint the pieces as I go, but as I said last time, there's there's always lots of touch up because um, yeah. I I tend to work with dirty hands, I guess, <laughs> mess up my own work. But yeah, there's lots of touch up. It's just a cheap acrylic paint, but boy, it covers. And I buy it in big bottles and um, it covers beautifully. And so as much as I can, I paint on the, the lathe and then touch up when it's off if necessary. And the flower in the vase, you can't see it very well, but it, I found it on the floor. So I don't know what it is. It's a weed that followed me in when I went outside to spray something and came back in. <laughs> oh, that's remarkable. Uh, <laughs> any more questions or comments for Jerry? How tall, Jerry? How tall is it overall? Oh, overall, let's see. Um, counting the lamp uh, sitting on top of the box goes up to about a foot. Okay. Okay. So, and it's all proportion to that. We just got a, a curio cabinet this week from a furniture store, and we're you know, starting to fill it up. It's you know glass with a mirror in the back, and and uh, I've already got three of the four rows full, <laughs> and I haven't put the the uh, nutcrackers in yet. <laughs> well, we'd like to see that. And uh, Jerry, don't, don't miss the chat. There's a whole lot of enthusiastic comments from about your work in the chat. Oh, 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 thank you. Okay, well, th thanks for letting me show this. All right, thanks for being here. Barry. Okay. I uh, Again, I came in after the uh, recording message came up and you have to Oh, and yeah. you have to, I came up you after the recording message was there, and you have to acknowledge that to be able yeah. to do anything. Anyhow, something I showed at the meeting on Tuesday night, uh, and I think for uh, people that sell small things at shows, it's a very good thing. It's this um, cocktail smoker. They, uh, I never heard of them until about a month ago, and they're real easy to turn, very forgiving. And uh, they sell for about $25 uh, at art shows or trade shows, whatever. Anyhow, it uh, has a little uh, double screen mesh insert there. And you put wood chips into it, like say cherry wood chips. And then with a, uh, a torch that you'd use for like creme brulee, browning or whatever, uh, you light the wood chips and the uh, smoke comes out the bottom holes uh, there on the side so that any ash that gets through doesn't fall into your drink. It lands here in the base. But it, uh, it fits nicely into a cocktail glass. You torch it for just a few seconds and the glass fills with smoke put the cap on, it smokes a little bit more, take it away and um, you're ready for a, a, a smoked scotch or a bourbon or whatever you want to put in there. Uh, there's a lot of versions of it on YouTube, uh, some more complex than others, but it seems that about $25 is the, uh, the selling price at trade shows and you can make a good number in a day. They're, they're very low tolerance and, or easy tolerance, put it that way. Where do you get the screen, Barry? And the screens are the screens are sold on Amazon. If you Google cocktail smoker screens. Okay, and what do uh, they cost? Five of them were nine dollars. Uh, you can get twelve for I think about $14. Does the, now does the smoke, 
actually change the flavor of the drink or is it just a visual yes. show? it does it's hard to say if it changes the flavor you know when you the smoke stays in there and so as you're sipping the, the bourbon or scotch or whatever you can't help but smell the uh, you know the smoke is right in your nostrils and you can't help but smell it um and i I have neither a sense of taste nor smell, so I really can't tell what is going on. But my wife took a sip of it and said, oh, you could definitely tell it. She couldn't tell that it was cherry that I had used. But, uh, and the shavings are the size of uh, what come off of a joiner. I have a helical head joiner and it produces shavings that are of ideal size, I think. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Any and I have one. Oh, yeah, I have one ahead. other thing. I don't know if uh, Duxbury is online here or not, uh, but I. Uh, not, I don't think. Bring it a, a variation on the duck chuck. <laughs> yeah, it keeps recurring. Um, when I tried to use it, no matter how tight I tightened it down, maybe I simply. Uh, undersized my uh, insert diameter that I couldn't tighten it enough. But when I tried to uh, turn, say, a six inch diameter five sided bowl, uh, by the time I was partway through turning, I realized that it was advancing in the chuck uh, and not at a predictable rate. It just I couldn't tighten it down enough to keep it in place. Um, and so, anyhow, I was. I, thought about, I made a family of uh, inserts. This one here is the one inch offset insert. On the back side has been turned, in this case, with uh, 15 degree taper draws to go into my VIC 120. Um, so when you clamp down on it, you are clamping on the the gap that's been bandsawed in here. And the piece that you insert and it has holes that are created for uh, three sides, four sides, five sides. Um, I'm not getting this. Uh, where does that go? Well, if you drop it in for your first turning made it very snug this time. You put it okay. onto that pin for the okay, first so turn. Where's the workpiece? Workpiece would be uh, however you want to attach it to this, whether you, uh, my preferred choice would be to bore, this is the two and an eighth inch diameter, would be to bore shallow uh, two and an eighth inch diameter in the bottom of your piece. Um, right where the foot will be, and then hot glue around the surface. So the uh, the interlocking of the piece and the, you know, the two and an eighth inch hole takes out all of the shear. And so it's just a torsion of turning that the glue has to uh, manage. You could also use newspaper or whatever. And with each, with each time you use it, you're gonna probably be cutting off uh, you know, losing maybe an eighth of an inch of this, so it's been made. So it's not too long out here, so it's going to induce anything, but uh, long enough that you can get multiple jobs out of it. And I have the labeling on here for, you know, it shows that like blue is, uh, I guess, five five sided. Uh, but they're all they're labeled around the rim and around the, the flange. And what's the, and the pin is what are you using for a pin there? The pin fixes it at whatever turning at whatever face you are. I got case. that. I got that. What is the pin? Oh, it's an aluminum, quarter inch aluminum rod. Okay. And right where the right where the pin protrudes, uh, 
Here's the uh, three quarter inch offset one. Right where the pin protrudes, <clears throat> I do uh, put it in the lathe, the, the pin itself in the lathe and with the file taken on down to where it's maybe 0.245 or something. So it goes easily into the, the hole in the, right. The hole that goes in there. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit. Hey, of tape. Barry, do you have any, uh, any photos of what you've turned with those? No, cause I haven't turned anything yet. Okay. <laughs> I will and I'll show it. Okay, great. <laughs> That's a really good variation of the duck's chuck. All right. I'd like to, I'm looking forward to seeing photos of finished work as well as work in progress on the thing. I think I follow what you're doing, but I'd really like to see pictures. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Barry. Anybody, uh, anybody other questions for Barry? I'll come right back with the piece that I made on the duck berry version. Okay. I'll take the spotlight off and meanwhile, so I get back to a gallery here. Um, I'm going to go over to uh, Mike and then I'm going to uh, go to Bert and Jim after that. Mike, uh, no, I don't think Barry's making it back quite yet, so I'm going to put you on. What do you got? Well, let's be fast. This is a, a, a new skill in process where I, I got some wood carving chisels from Record Power and I've been playing with them for embellishing uh you know cutting little things on the side and well you and, cut the foot though too that foot is pretty yeah the, the, the foot, foot. The, the, w that was an experiment i like the foot but what i found it it's it's way too hard to do this manually with carving chisels it's a whole lot easier to do it the way i did it before which is with a coping saw and then i use a dremel with a little sanding uh drum on it uh yeah, so that was just to see how difficult it was carving away the waste, and it was too, it was easier to cut it away with a coping saw. Uh, here's a little cherry one I did, and it was kind of a sample board where I used different types, different chisels, and different cutting techniques on the surface. I get four, you know, divided into four parts and used different different texturing uh, cutting techniques, and then did a little cutting on the outside. So it's it's a work. Are you are you thinking of like doing one of those wax finish things where the color goes into the carving and uh, no, you know, well, that kind of stuff? No, I'm thinking more like maybe dyeing it and then doing what it calls sagriti or whatever and cutting through the dye maybe. Um, graffiti. Graffiti, yeah. And and then I played with the rim of this a little bit and then. Wait a, minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You just walked right past the spiral on the stem there. What's yeah, that's, that's, that, that was with a sorby, large sorby spiraling tool. And so you're doing these like just as an exploration. Now, right? yeah, this, yeah, this is just trying to see what I can do and how much effort it is for, for embellishing. And, and that's all. Uh, I used a, a chisel to cut the little crenellations for a chest piece for a queen to see how much effort it was and I, and I found out this is very simple and very easy uh it, it's actually almost easier than using a uh chainsaw file to do crenellations hey mike um one of the recommendations i have for you is get some of those toe tags that they you can get a bunch of them from amazon cheap and then tie one of them onto each of these pieces and write information about what you did for that because I find sometimes I'll pick up a piece later and not remember how I made it. Yeah. Uh, and, and these explorations you're doing are really important later if you want to say, well, I like this part or that part. And yeah, it's good to, to write down how you did it. Now, now, what's a toe tag? That's just a little tag with a, with a string. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you can get them yeah. Sizes. I use the ones that are about uh, two inches by three inches. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea because otherwise I move on and I don't get back to it for a long time. <laughs> if I don't have a video, I don't have instructions. <laughs> well, you wind up with a whole lot of stuff. I mean, I've, I've been kind of reworking it in the depths of my shop and I'm finding boxes and tubs full of labeled parts from projects 30 years ago. <laughs> I, I don't go back to them. I think I might, but I never do. Yeah, that's all I got. <laughs> 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Barry, back to you. Okay. Um, this piece here, uh, you have to see it like you can see the corners on it here. This yeah. is a piece. This is a piece that did progress, but I uh, I was able to realize that, correct it, but it lost some of its size. But you can. Uh -huh. This yeah. was done as a four sided piece. Um, and it's just a, a weed pot, so there's no uh, bolt hole, hollowing inside other than the uh, the drilled hole and cleaned up. Very cool. Very cool. Questions, comments, anybody? Okay. And you've just, you've just got that glued on, Barry? Um, yeah, that one I uh, I actually hard glued it, you know, right face to face, but I wasn't sure about it flying off. And then I used a uh, a one sixteenth inch uh, parting tool to just cut right through it, and then I had to reverse it to uh, finish up the bottom. Amazing work! It's a, a I think that's a lot more. Uh, stress on the whole thing that the duck's chuck was ever designed for. I mean, he's mostly doing little medallions and things on it, and you're doing a whole uh, piece that extends out six inches off the chuck. Um, and by the way, these were turned were turned using a tailstock in place. There was excess okay. there was excess wood out here that was mounted, you know, in the with the four holes in it. Actually, I didn't make the hole. It was just after I repositioned this on the headstock, that I'd bring the tailstock in wherever it hit. And so it was supported so it wouldn't shatter. He were okay. really heavy cuts. Right. So yeah, that that makes good sense. It makes a lot of sense. You'd have to do that, you know. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh Bert? Okay, this uh, his uh, comments about uh, accuracy uh, is a good segue into what I had to do here. So um, a lady does this bead work, and a couple of years ago I made her this needle case. So it's just a simple wooden needle case, half inch nominal, but she made this beading for it, and now she's doing a course. She's teaching other people how to do this procedure. And so she needed some more. So I made a couple of more for her, gave it to her. And she says, well, they're really, really nice, but they're not the same size. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? So she gave me this sample. So this is the original one I made for her two years ago. And she made the pattern that's on here to match this exact size of needle case. So I had to go out and uh, make some more needle cases that exactly fit in here exactly to the thousandth of an inch. This barrel, I had to measure it, it is 0 0.565. 0 0.570 will not fit. And 0 0.560 <laughs> is too loose. So all of these needle cases are within three to four thousandths of an inch of the original. And so, uh, the yeah. first... The, how did you make the needle cases, Bert? Come on, take it. Should <clears throat> well, needle cases are simple. They're just they're they're just a <clears throat> a hole and another hole, and you fit these together. Well, wait a minute. No, 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 no. Then what you turn them first? on the lathe. What do you oh, do well, the, first? First off, you drill the this hole for the this hole for the lid, and then you fit the tenon. So that's and just you, doing, the, you you drill it on the lathe or drill it on the drill press? I drill it on a lathe, yeah. And then okay. uh, once you have the fit tenon, you drill this hole. So that part's just a standard needle case. The, the point here is that the OD of this needle case had to be exactly 0 0.565, so it will slide in there, slip okay. fit. Now, now that we know how you made the needle case, how did you get it to be the exact size? What did you do? I uh, used a skew. And I, uh, I learned that, uh, and, I, and I made the uh, the blanks a little bit longer than they needed to be, so I could have, have them between centers, and then I marked and off the exact length. 
and then I and turned them down you? with a skew by hand. How much bigger in diameter were they? Were the blanks on the finished piece? Uh, well, the blanks initially were uh, three quarter by three quarter, and this piece is uh, zero point five six five uh, in okay, diameter. Off, of course, an eighth of a, yeah, an eighth of an inch. Yeah. Quarter inch. Yeah. Okay. Well, like and, getting uh, the eighth of an inch off is not bad. It's when you get down close to the half inch. Like I said, the first one I made when I tried to duplicate it, I made three of them before I got one that fit. And it took me about six hours. And then I realized that uh, I got to figure out a better way to do this because six hours times 12 is just not feasible. And uh, I learned how to use my skew and that flat gonna, bevel. She's going to um, glue those bead the beadwork on there. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, w once they uh, finish their beadwork and they yeah. put it on, they actually glue it to the thing. But the, the critical the thing, thing is, is that uh, trying to get it down, I had lots of them where I got down to 570. And my next cut made it too small. I had to throw it away. So I had to learn how to take uh, very, very light cuts. And I was able to get down to taking two thousandths of an inch. So that gives you a four thou uh, diameter. And uh, and then once you learn that technique with the skew and you ride the bevel, you can get fine dust off there. You can take it down four thousandths of an inch on diameter uh, consistently. What are you measuring that diameter with? Uh, uh, vernier caliper, uh, digital vernier caliper. Okay. So I had to caliper at all the full length. So the full length is, uh, there, there's less than two thousandths of an inch difference on the full length of that. So it's yeah. a challenge. It's a good wood turning challenge. If you need some practice to get some skew practice, these are, <laughs> this one was a great challenge to do. I'm never, never going to do how, it again. How long are these? Uh, there are two, uh, three, three and a quarter inches overall length, three and a quarter inches. So you start with a four and a four and three quarter inch blank. Hey, Bird, I have a question. Is yep. the person who does the beading, are they able to reproduce the same inside diameter every time? Oh, yes, uh, they, they do because uh, their beads are a specific size. And that's part, I guess, of the uh, of the training course that the lady's putting on is that uh, she teaches them how to uh, follow the pattern. And the beads are a specific size. I forget what size they are, but yeah, that bead they're, size. They're, they're pretty yeah. accurately calibrated. They're, re those they're yeah, really but accurate. It, but when they uh, string them together, you know, some people make looser beads, some people make tighter beads. Yeah. Well, and I guess that's part of the training course. And that's where uh, Carol was saying that uh, when they do the course, that's the challenge for them, too, is that they have to have the accuracy. That's why she made this particular pattern design specifically to fit that diameter of a tube. So now to teach somebody to use that pattern, they have to use the exact size of tube. <laughs> so. Well, if you I, want I, to, I, speed, to speed this up, a South Bend lathe like I have in the back room uh, allows you to dial it into the thousand. To, I, I, I cheat a lot with that when I'm making dots that I inset in all my uh, furniture now. <laughs> okay, yeah, I did. I, I just wanted to do it by hand because of the challenge, and uh, and uh, yeah, it was a challenge, and it's great skew practice. I mean, that's what we're here for is just to have some fun with it and do a challenge. I'm finding that's all the same thing. In, I'm finding the same thing in turning long dowels, and I then want to mm -hmm. thread. Uh, if the dowel is a teeny, teeny bit too big, then it, the thread box breaks the thread. <laughs> yeah, there's a, a right size, and if you get, yeah, you can be under it, but you cannot be over it. <laughs> it's all fun with the skew. You don't sand those. If you sand those, all you're going to do is make your cutter dull in the thread box, and the thread box cutter is difficult to sharpen and even more difficult to set. So you, you get it right, you want to leave it alone. Well, one, one other thing with these, with a the skew, you get a really nice finish, and if you sand it, you make it too small. I did that a couple of times. I hit it with 220 Absolutely. sandpaper and it was a couple of thou came off and they were loose. So I had to throw them away. So oh, afterwards, yeah. I got used to using the skew and you get a beautiful finish. If you touch it with sandpaper, you screw it up. <laughs> so Bert, you, you realize that this lady is giving courses to teach other ladies how to make this and you are the single source uh, for... <laughs> <laughs> I see... I see a dating future for Bert if you want it. <laughs> They'll bring you well, casserole. Watch out. What, one of the nice things about it, though, too, is that uh, they're learning how to make their own patterns. 
So the next ones around, I can probably make them a different size as long as they're all the same. <laughs> the challenge is making one to match something I made two years ago. That was that was a challenge. Yeah, that's always the case. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, thank you very much, Bert. That's very interesting and amusing. Over to you, Bowman. You got the you, you take us home. What are you gonna? What, what do you got? I will uh, show you what I got. Um, cleaning my shop up. Um, can you tell, can you tell which is the tool and which is the picture of it? <laughs> when I finally, I kept all my, the, the tools in the front of the picture, I kept all them in an old, um, silverware drawer. And then every time I needed something, I had to root through it. I didn't have things assigned. I said, this is ridiculous. I'm in the middle of turning. I need that. I want to reach for it and get it. So I took a day and I made myself this rack that leans over. And then I said, now, how am I going to get the things back in? Well, I spent an hour on Photoshop making sure I had an exact copy of the tools in their place. And I pasted them with adhesive glue uh, <laughs> on where the tools go. So now I just go visually and I grab them. And if I have one, I just put it back. So it's my way of cleaning the shop. I'm kind of proudest get... of how I mounted my two uh, sets of uh, SAE and millimeter uh, Allen wrenches at the top. Uh, but this is everything I would normally use when I'm working on the lathe, not my chisels, but the stuff related to it. So yeah, it was so just do you, ever, do you ever reach for a picture and confuse it, think the tool is in place there, you know? I mean, I, it, it, I just finished it, and I already noticed that that may be a possibility. <laughs> yeah, I think that's very clever. Well, I just thought it's fun. It's a uh, my you... son-in-law doubts my that I will keep the shop organized. He said you're going to get it all screwed up. I said nope, this will work. What are you using to print those things with? Um, I have a Epson printer. Uh, I mean, just eight and a half, eleven pieces of paper. I used eight by eight and a half. I used the legal size because the Echo System printer I use, which is the cheap printer for me, um, I I had a legal size paper because my board is twenty four inches wide, so it's twelve inches to the middle, and then whatever I can get on an eight and a half becomes the gap in between. So. Yeah, other... it was it was fun. I think it's gonna work. I really do. Well, where are you gonna put that board? That's the other question. Where's it, that gonna be? It, it, hung. it hangs and it leans against. I have a table through the middle. I guess you remember that, John. Through the middle, uh, it's gonna build my sailboat on, which I didn't because I got into turning. But it leans on that, and uh, uh, so it's my lathe is literally uh, to my back when I'm looking at these tools. There's a a walkway okay. it's behind you behind you turn around for the tool yeah no not this one i turn around for my chisels this one i got to go around the lathe and come over it's not close enough to reach and usually what i'm doing with these tools is not something i would be doing on the lathe so. yep uh, just for fun all right uh who else we got here um ron you got a hand up we got a minute left what do you got ron You're muted, Ron. If you turn Ronnie your mic off. There. I have a project. I got to make 20 boxes, three inch diameter, about four inches high. I need about seven or eight feet of baseball bats if anybody's got any blanks laying around. Uh, you want to ash for the boxes, you mean? Uh, it doesn't matter really what it is. Whatever I can find, I'm going to make them out of. They're. Uh, they got to be just used to store pencils in, stacks of colored pencils for artwork. So how long do the blanks need to be? About four inches. Four inches and the, and the three inches in diameter. About a three inch diameter, yeah. Total yeah. of about seven or eight feet it's going to take for all of them. Okay. Uh, let me look around. I might have some stuff that might work for you. 
anybody in the Lancaster area has anything, get in touch with me. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Ron. Um, all right, we're on the hour. Anybody else got a last word you want to say? I'm going to Ken say thank you all. Point about the spindle master. Is Ken still there? Yeah, Ken is here somewhere. Yeah, I'm still here. Right. When I do mine, I never sharpen the radius. Radius. Right. I polish it on a metal buff. Okay. And I got on the Sorby site and they said that you should, I think you should only uh, take some material off the top, never that's work correct. on it. Yeah. Okay. But I, over here, if you messed up the tool, Sorby will take it back and repolish it for you and reshape it, oh, which is a okay. very good uh, service. Whether they All still right. do or not, I don't know. But when we first had them out here, that was their thought. But I always make certain that I've got a lovely high polished radius on the back by using it on a buff and the buff takes nothing off and then you use a diamond i only use a diamond across the front what okay. are we talking about here what do these things look like if you, if you could hold it up again Dan. you wouldn't I haven't mind got mine here otherwise i'll show okay. you we almost yeah. well, we lost we, we had them when we lost them wait a minute i gotta find them here spotlight them i'm sorry i'm uh Lost there you go, there, it there, you. there it is. It's it's flat. Okay, there. flat on top. I didn't realize. Yeah, flat on the there. top. There is no. No. What radius do you want this for? What's it for? It's well, spindle. it was on a a, a site, an auction site, and uh, nobody was bidding on it, so I just decided to bid on it. So just to see what it was, I'd heard of them before. Well, is it any? I mean, is it? It doesn't work the way you have it. Is that right? Well. I mean, I, uh, I, yeah, it works a little bit. Uh, I'm still <laughs> learning how to use the tool. You know how new tools are. You have to learn how to use them. But I'd really like to get it in good shape, perfect shape, so I'd, I'm learning the right things. Yeah. Is that like to replace a gouge? Uh, it, no, it's more. I don't than... think it's more. It's, it's all for spindle work, so maybe. Yeah, it's, it's worked on the idea of the skew, Ken. Yeah, yeah. So I was able to get a, this is a one inch version and I still have the original containers actually. And then here's a quarter inch. Also, you can see they, they tried to, can you see the surface? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty messed up, but it's fairly sharp yeah. and it does cut wood, but I'm still learning how to use it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all. <laughs> okay, Ken. Yeah. See you all Hope next week. Helped. <laughs> I'll report back when I get it going. Perfect. See you all next week. Wood shop. Thank God for wood. <laughs>